webinar is organized jointly by OECD, UNDP, and uh, UN Women. I am going to be your moderator. My name is Mary Kawar, and uh, I will start by uh, welcoming everybody, your excellencies, uh, guests, academics, researchers, civil society organizations from the Middle East and North Africa and outside the Middle East and North Africa. I'm very happy to be moderating this seminar, and I would really like to uh, congratulate uh, OECD, UN Women, and UNDP for coming together in organizing this high-level dialogue. So the purpose of our webinar is to put a spotlight on the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on Arab women, and whether and how countries have taken into account their policy responses. This is a policy dialogue which intends to assess three overarching issues. First, the extent to which women are part of the general government responses. And second, the extent that, the extent that um, whether and how women's specific needs and challenges were addressed. We all know about the increased care burden, about the increase in gender-based violence that requires specific responses. And third, what about the future? Are there opportunities in the changing policy landscape? I really hope that this dialogue will provide us with a platform of your experiences from the several countries that we will be representing. Now, in general, in the Arab countries and in my own country, Jordan, the COVID-19 have actually intensified pre-existing challenges. We have high female unemployment rates, which compound in pre-existing low economic participation rates. We have a, a lack of pay equity. We have discrimination in the workplace. We don't have, uh, we have a limited affordable childcare. In parallel, we have weak social policies that address women as needy, as vulnerable, and the need for And when it comes to issues that they need assistance, let's say like, legal rights, like citizenship for their children, uh, or inheritance rights, we find that the policy become too limited for them. So I am hoping that we will be addressing some, if not all of these questions. And um, so it is therefore a great value to exchange ideas and perspectives between the countries and different stakeholders. We have international organizations speaking, civil society, private sector, and government. The three organizations, OECD, UNDP, and UN Women, have been working closely with different stakeholders in the Middle East and North Africa to analyze the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on women's economic empowerment and in supporting countries to include a gender perspective into their crisis response measures. Personally, I would like to congratulate them for their quick and effective response. There was really a lot of research for me to go over um, when I was preparing for this, and this is unlike previous crises that the region went through. So now allow me to provide you a brief overview of our webinar. We have high-level representatives from the three agencies who will kick off the webinar by providing their perspectives as well as key policy recommendations on how the crisis can be an opportunity to address gender equality in the long term. The first session of the webinar will then put the spotlight on Tunisia and Egypt and how these countries have managed to integrate a gender equality perspective into their COVID-19 response and recovery measures, and what are the remaining outstanding challenges for furthering women's economic empowerment in light of the crisis. Here, I warmly welcome Minister Asma Shiri Laabadi, uh, and represent, that's from Tunisia, and representing the president of the Egyptian National Council for Women, we have Ms. Dina El Serafi. The second session of the, the webinar, second session will we'll give the floor to representatives from different organizations and institutions, including the private sector and civil society organization. They will highlight how their organizations are contributing 
towards enhanced women's economic empowerment in the aftermath of the COVID-19. So without further ado, please allow me to introduce the representatives of OECD, UN Women, and UNDP who will be providing the opening remarks. So in this sequence, we will start with Mr. Juan Guillermo, Deputy Chief of Staff to the Secretary General, OECD, followed by Moaez Dure, Re Acting Regional Director, UN Women Regional Office for Arab States, and finally, Raquel Lagunas, Acting Director of Gender UNDP. Mr. Juan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kawar, Minister. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. If you don't, please, um, please let me know. I'm not sure what I can do uh, technolog technologically, but I will do my best at least to speak up. And I hope the image and the, and the voice uh, gets to you uh, smoothly. So dear ministers, uh, distinguished guests, uh, ladies, gentlemen, really delighted to be able to, to join you today together with our UNDP colleagues and UN Women colleagues in, in this webinar on the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on women's economic empowerment in the Middle East and North Africa in the MENA region. Uh, let me first of all really express my special thanks to all the gender champions for being here today, in particular the Minister of Women, Family, Children and Seniors of Tunisia, Ms. Asma Shiri Labidi, President of the Egyptian National Council for Women, Dr. Maya Morsi, and the former Jordanian Minister of Planning and International Cooperation, of course, uh, Dr. Mari Kawar, who is hosting us uh, today. Really congratulations to all of you, a great honor, great privilege to be here and for the OECD to be joining uh, these wonderful partners in the quest, uh, in the fight uh, for women's gender equality and women's economic uh, empowerment. I also want to give a warm welcome uh, to the Ambassador of Sweden to Egypt, Mr. Jan Teslev, who's going to take over the co-chairmanship of the MENA OECD Women's Economic Empowerment Forum from Ambassador of Sweden to Algeria, Ms. Mary Claire Swart Capra. So glad to have you all here on board with us. I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's become a cliche to say that we're living in unprecedented times, but that's not make the concerns that we have today any less important or dramatic. You all know that the pandemic has exposed the fragility that we have in our economies and in our societies, that they have made many of the cleavages and inequalities worse. And of course, the gender inequality is one of the most concerning ones, especially in the countries in this region. Let me just give you some sobering figures that we have been collecting at the OECD on the impact of the crisis. First, the health impact. So far, over 500,000, half a million lives have been lost due to the pandemic, together with over 10 million recorded cases globally. And the MENA region has just passed the 1 million mark in recorded cases. And as you know, the health crisis is having a cascading impact on our economy. Just for this year, we estimate a 6% annual decline in global GDP. And this is our good case scenario. This is the upbeat scenario without a second wave of infections, which as you know, many countries are already experiencing. In this second case, we could expect a global GDP decline of more than seven and a half percent. These are our latest projections which we just issued at the beginning of June. It's the worst, the worst uh, economic scenario that we've had uh, since the Great Depression in the 1930s. But of course, beyond the immediate health, beyond the immediate economic impact, we are worried about the long-term cost, the long-term impact of this crisis. The effects, the social costs could be long-lasting. As I said, the crisis is effectively magnifying pre-existing inequalities that were already growing over the last couple of decades. Let's put some numbers into context in the Arab region. An additional 8.3 million people are expected to fall into poverty. More than 110 million students have been affected by school closures. And as the region has the highest rate of youth unemployment in the world, close to 27%, disruption in education, job training, is effectively jeopardizing the future. We are potentially creating what we have referred to in our latest employment outlook, which we issued yesterday, a corona generation, which will be hampered 
in its future empowerment. And of course, women are at the center of those vulnerabilities. Women, low incomes, temporary jobs, part-time jobs, uh, and of course, all the responsibilities they have in household care and home care uh, and family care, of course, makes them amongst the most vulnerable of all the groups as we have identified as well in our employment outlook. They're also at the center of the health uh, workforce. They are the prime workers, the prime uh, supporters of uh, sick people and patients, both in hospitals and at home. So gender equality has never been more important. Gender, uh, the, the impact of the crisis on gender inequality has never been greatest. As you know, before the crisis, we were experiencing some progress in the region in a number of areas, not in all, but in a number of important areas. But now effectively, we are risking reversing decades of gains. It's not just in the MENA region, it's around the world, but certainly in the MENA region, there is a risk of reversing decades of gain that we had uh, in women's empowerment and gender equality. The crisis is having a disproportionate impact on girls and women. And this we have documented very clearly with respect to OECD countries in one of the 117 policy briefs that the OECD has issued in this digital hub on our website since the crisis started. We have covered all the policy issues, but I really invite you to read this particular policy brief that is focusing, zooming in on the question of women. Uh, in the context of the, of the crisis. And we have one specifically, uh, one brief for OECD countries, and one specifically on women's economic empowerment in the MENA region and the impact of COVID-19. So I invite you very much to look at the broad uh, policy brief on, on the impact of the crisis, on gender equality in the OECD, and the one specifically looking at the MENA region. Both available on our website, on the digital hub. Let me just give you just really a handful, four uh, key findings uh, of this report. Again, sobering, worrying, uh, concerning uh, findings. First, as I just said, women are at the forefront of fighting the pandemic. Now, globally, 70% of healthcare workers are women. And the region is no exception. But despite putting their own lives at risk to save the life of others, Women, as you know, face a massive, a, a yawning wage income gap. In the OECD, it's about 15% on average. In the, re in the MENA region, we're talking close to 30%, a 30% gender pay gap, and only slowly being closed. As you know, also the crisis had put nurses in particular, women working in the, in the um, long-term care, but also in the broader medical health sector, are they, are they, of course, represent an overproportionate share of the labor force in this sector. And they are the one being pushed for the lot to work the longest hours with the, these reduced salaries. Second finding, we all know that when there is a need to help at home, when the children stay at home because of confinement to do teleschooling or, or just to be uh, as scared as, as well as possible by their families, it is practically always the mothers, the women, uh, who have to take up the additional burden. They take the additional burden of harsh work, the additional burden of taking care of children at home and of the sick elderly. And this is driven, as we all know, by social norms, by stigmas, even family laws in some countries. Even before the crisis in the region, women were spending six times as much as men on unpaid domestic work at home. And with the crisis, the subsequent increase in domestic responsibilities it can also risk giving up on education, giving up on jobs. Third key finding, when there are layoffs, is women who suffer most. Women work more part-time, more, more in informal sector. In the MENA region, 62% more men, women than men are in the informal sector. And of course, they are the highest risk of layoffs and the least protected by social uh, security, social protection, and in particular by healthcare. There is a massive, as you know, labor force participation gap in the region, 50% between uh, men and women. And the UN Economic and Social uh, Commission for Western Asia has estimated that women in the Arab world will lose approximately 700,000 jobs as a result of the crisis. Final point, and of course, certainly far from least, women are facing, and as Dr. Kawa just mentioned, 
women were facing already a major problem of domestic violence, intimate part of violence, as it's sometimes called. And this has only got much worse, has only been intensified as a result of confinement and other policy measures. Even before the crisis, 35% of married women in the region had reported experiencing intimate partner violence. The numbers, the, the evidence that we're collecting from countries in the region talk about increases of more than 30% um, in terms of reports, uh, sometimes five times increases or, or in calls or to helplines compared to the same period in, in the last year. So these are the sobering findings have, that we all have to take into account as we think about the future, but also we think about the present, and what we need to do now, what are the policy measures to arrest, control, tackle and fight uh, the problem of uh, gender uh, violence, the problem of uh, gender inequality and the issue of women's economic empowerment. Where do we go from here? Let me just give you uh, a few ideas uh, again from our briefs and, and our research. First of all, I want to recognize and congratulate the governments in the region for all the many steps that have been taken concerning their policy response that are going to help women. We know of measures specifically targeting women, including providing support for women workers by means of paid leave, flexible working arrangements, unemployment, sick leave benefits, income support, access to loans, and more, many of which are general for all workers, but in some cases are specifically targeting women in the region. And this is, this is, this is excellent. This is something that we need to support and continue uh, to provide, as many other OECD countries are doing. And we need to continue in this in these measures and also take all the necessary actions uh, to tackle domestic violence, as I said, through increasing helplines, shelters, counseling uh, for victims. Final point is, let's think about protection, certainly. Let's think about controlling uh, the impact of the crisis, but let's also think about what we can do in terms of turning this crisis into an opportunity. And every crisis has a silver lining. Every crisis opens opportunities. And certainly in the, in the case of women, it is, open up, it is opening up opportunities that we should all be ready to grab and, and to support. To build back better, we need, first of all, to have a stronger social protection system. And this system needs to focus on the needs of the most vulnerable and women in particular. And we know the region lags behind on unemployment benefit programs, on having truly effective and universal uh, health insurance protection. But most importantly, women in the region have exceptional potential, and you, all the women there in the room, you all, you all know this, I don't need to remind you of this, but our statistics just confirm what you already know. In the region, women have surpassed men in tertiary education enrollment by 20%. Up to 57% of all STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics graduates in the region are women. This is way above the average in the OECD, which is only 30%. So at least on average, perhaps it's not the same in every country, but at least on average, the MENA region is ahead of the OECD average in terms of preparing their women for future or the present of new technologies for artificial intelligence for green growth, for green jobs. So women are there, they have the necessary skills. Yet we know that the biggest challenge is the barriers, the glass ceilings, the social norms, the legislation that women face and that stops them from delivering uh, on their full potential. So if there's any one message, a final message that I want to give is that we tackle those barriers, that we address them. Just like many OECD countries have done. Nobody is, is free of sin. Nobody has cleared all those barriers, certainly. And it's, of course, a battle that will never end, hopefully one day. But uh, certainly in the MENA region, this is one of the strongest uh, focuses that we need in order to address inequalities, in order to uh, leverage the full potential of women in the region. I am very proud, once again, of this uh, participating in this event. Really glad that this is a multi-stakeholder dialogue, because that is the only way to achieve real change. It's not just governments, it's working with business, it's working with labor unions, it's working with NGOs, with civil society, that will really achieve the necessary change. So very much hope that through this event and our broader MENA OECD initiative, we will be able to facilitate the exchange, the peer learning, and of course, drawing all the lessons that we need in order to deliver 
a more inclusive and gender sensitive society. The OECD will be there to accompany you. You have all our support and you can always count on us. So once again, thank you very much and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Juan, for first the sobering context and then the uh, future looking silver lining and proposals. Um, uh, Moaz, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mary. Assalamu alaikum. Greetings to all. Excellency Asma, Shirila Abidi, Minister of Women, Family and Childhood in Tunisia. Excellency Masaki Noko, Ambassador of Japan to Egypt. Excellency Jan Theslev, Ambassador of Sweden to Egypt. Ms. Dina Serafi, International Cooperation Specialist from the Egyptian National Council of Women, honorable representatives of national institutions, excellencies, and distinguished guests and friends. It is indeed a pleasure uh, to join you on behalf of UN Women today to discuss the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the economic situation of Arab women to assess the crisis response from a gender perspective, and more important to hear from you on how we can together build up better for a gender equal economy. We started this year full of promise because this year 2020 marked several important milestones for gender equality, including the 25th anniversary of the Beijing and uh, platform of action and the five-year milestone of Agenda 2030, including SDG 5, and also UN Women celebrating its 10th anniversary, which we just did last week. So 2020 was anticipated to be a transformative year towards gender equality moving us closer to the full realization of women's rights. But then the pandemic struck, even risking gains already achieved. As mentioned by Juan Yermo, the pandemic found the, the region facing persisting gender gaps, particularly on the fronts of opportunities for economic and political participation. Juan highlighted the achievements in terms of capabilities, education, but the backlog remains with respect to opportunities for employment. The region started the pandemic with the lowest rate of labor force participation of any region, about two fifths of women participate in the labor force. Interestingly, when my dear colleague, Dori, uh, Dr. Mary Kawar and I probably started our careers a while ago, in my case, three decades ago, the region at the time also had the same labor force participation rate. So in 30 years, there has not been progress in terms of women's participation in formal uh, employment and in the labor force, despite the agency and innovativeness and resourcefulness and dynamism of Arab women. The pandemic struck and now on various macroeconomic indicators, we see a reversal or a slowdown. The IMF anticipates the worst economic crisis in the Great uh, depression, projecting that over 170 countries will experience negative per capita income growth this year. It was mentioned regionally, uh, ESQA estimates the pandemic will result in about 1.7 million jobs lost, including approximately 700,000 held by women. According to ILO, working hours in the Arab states declined in the first quarter of 2020 by an act approximately 1 million full-time jobs. 
Furthermore, it is estimated that almost one third of the employed population in the region is facing high risks of layoff or reduction of wages and or hours of work. This is to compound the problems of youth unemployment and uh, low labor force participation rates for women that were highlighted before. Workers in the informal economy are also at higher risk with 89% of them estimated to be significantly impacted by lockdown measures. And as we are aware, women constitute the majority of workers in the informal sector in the Arab region. At the country level, I'll give Lebanon as an example. A recent UN Women study suggests that the effect of the current economic contraction is estimated to result in a 14 to 19% reduction in women's employment. It was mentioned that like the rest of the world, women in the Arab region constitute about 70% of the workers in the health sector a higher share of uh, nurses, about uh, 90% in Egypt and 80% in Lebanon. So women are the backbone of the health response that we all now rely on. And their additional effort in that response is recognized while unequal wages persist. Now, rising demand in the context of the pandemic for care has deepened the already existing inequalities in the gender division of paid and unpaid labor and care. A statistic was mentioned about women's share of unpaid care in UN Women and with other partners we estimated to be about 4.7 times men's share. And the availability of affordable and quality care is key and an enabler for women and men to allocate time to the paid labor market and to contribute more to economic growth. So women's employment and income generation activities are the first and most negatively affected. Uh, women to tend to work in occupations which are less amenable to telecommuting and are more likely to work in the informal economy. So colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this webinar focuses on a very important challenge. We are key to look at policy responses together and also to see what opportunities the current pandemic offers to build back better. Just last week, I was briefed on a UN Women survey in eight Arab countries concerning the changes that the pandemic brought in gender relations. The survey sample per country was quite respectable. And among the unexpected results, still to be verified, is that the, in terms of increase in share of care and unpaid labor, the increase that women have experienced under the pandemic is not that different from the increase that men have experienced. My preliminary interpretation is that women had already started from a high baseline, so their margin of increase was limited, but men starting from a low baseline experienced a larger margin of increase. And we are keen, keen to work with you, with civil society, with governments, with our partners, UNDP and the OECD, to capitalize and leverage such changes that the pandemic have uh, brought, positive changes that we can capitalize on to build back better. I look forward to the interventions from Her Excellency, the Minister from Tunisia and Mrs. Serafi from Egypt about how recovery packages as a response to the crisis are applying a gender perspective. We are very appreciative of our partnership 
and our work in support of national efforts in these two countries and other uh, uh, Arab countries. And let me close by looking into the future and highlighting that prioritizing investment in robust health and social protection systems, as Quan mentioned, is vital to ensure the sustainable uh, recovery. Also, we have the transformative uh, opportunity to make sustained investments in the care economy, in redressing long-standing inequalities by valuing, supporting, and equally sharing core work, care work. Thank you very much for this opportunity, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Moaiz, for this and for uh, highlighting the need for transformative measures and the need for partnerships and working together from the global <coughs> to the national as well. Now I would like to give the floor to Ms. Lagunas. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mary Kawar, Mr. Juan Germo, Mr. Moez Zorai, Excellencies and Ambassadors, and guests and friends. Thank you so much for inviting UNDP to this uh, very relevant webinar. We see this as an opportunity to uh, discuss co with key policymakers in Egypt and Tunisia about the measures that uh, they are taking, and in general in the MENA region, are taking to address the impact, uh, the economic impact of COVID-19 on women and girls. And it is timely because this is a, 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 an opportunity to rethink development, to rethink the social contract, and to rethink what do we want for the future for all. So thank you so much. Uh, I will touch three policy areas uh, that for UNDP are vital to engage globally and regionally to advance a, a gender responsive economic uh, recovery. The first one, and you, uh, my, 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 the previous panelists touched all of them. The first one is the digital divide as an opportunity for SMEs in the region to enter the post COVID era. The second is supporting women owned SMEs and encouraging women's entrepreneurships. And the third one is the options, different options for universal basic income as a very promising non-contributory social protection measure that can reach those that usually are left behind. And as the colleagues were mentioning, usually we have women, right? Uh, women and girls uh, uh, um, left behind. So I'm going to address more concrete uh, responses to complement my colleagues' interventions. In terms of the digital divide, we all know that the results of the lockdowns imposed to restrict the spread of COVID led to a massive move to work from home, to working online, right? So COVID has accelerated, on the one hand, a digital transformation, but also on the other hand, has uh, put in evidence the digital divide and even widening the pre-existing inequalities and gender inequalities. So I just wanted to give you one number that is coming from OECD reports. Today, worldwide, 300 27 million fewer, fewer women than men have smartphones and can access to mobile internet. So the challenges for Middle East and, and North Africa is also uh, in every country is different, various across regions. We know how some Gulf countries have the highest internet penetration and gender parity in access to internet, but other countries have much lower rates of internet penetration, around 50% even in some middle-income countries of the region, so, and wider gender gaps. So to move of some countries to provide, when we move to provide uh, in countries, uh, pro provide education online during the lockdown, we all know how uh, disparities were highlighted with girls, even though they are often performing better than boys in a school, when they are at home, they are unable to access to education because usually they, they have many tasks to do. The, the part of the care work that Moes uh, they, they was highlighting, they were also the last ones in the line, in the queue to access to mobile phone. And in many households, they do not have uh, internet, they do not have access to data. 
because it costs money and it is expensive. So the gender digital divide affects also livelihoods, education and connected to education livelihoods and entrepreneurships. Uh, in fact, uh, it's very, very evident how more agile, more agile, digital agile companies can recover and are recovering, are recovering better and coping better with the crisis. So to address this challenge, what we need, and at least that's what UNDP is discussing and implementing, is to ex expand the digitalization to women and those left behind. So what can we do? Uh, I will give you just three, three proposals that uh, we are implementing with partners, as I said. Improve and target digital skills training is at the core of the digital divide. And we don't want to talk uh, uh, here about um, educated women in the, in the Gulf. We wanted to talk also about farmers, women farmers, accessing to digital payment systems and helping families uh, business to move online, to transition to, to onla online business. There are good examples. So the second idea is how can we help redirect investments to close the, gender, the, the, the um, gender digital divide in business? And this can be done, for instance, by first enabling and promoting foreign and local investments in gender responsive digital firms and companies. Second, developing and expanding inclusive digital infrastructure. And third, facilitating the digital adoption by non-digital businesses. So there is a range of measures that we can uh, in implement, as well as ensuring that the digital transformation of the value change are gender responsive. So there are, there are as I said, many measures, but the first one, it, it needs to be yes or yes, governments moving to services online, needs to accompany this with cheaper um, free access to internet. Otherwise, we recreate the, the, the gaps, the labor gaps and the digital gaps. So uh, the, the second uh, topic that I wanted to talk uh, and share with all of you is women in business. So we heard how the low levels of participation of women in the formal workforce in the region and also the disproportionate uh, and relatively low, is still low, participation of women in informal sector. So to ensure that women-owned SMEs are not left behind, it is really important to come back to the first topic, to digitalization, redefine and repurpose the value chain and, and, and human capital and decision making. So there are great examples, including some banks that have uh, agreed to give uh, women-owned businesses interest-free loans. So it's possible, and that's the message that UNDP wants to convey. The future for all is possible, and it is a choice. So let's discuss how can we make it happen. Um, I will go to the third topic because I understand we are a little bit running behind, right, in terms of time. Um, I wanted to address uh, the issue of universal uh, basic income. And I wanted to share a uh, few thoughts here about the potential of these kind of measures to alleviate the conditions of all those ones that are in informal sectors and, and with the most uh, particular vulnerabilities. And we know again that women and girls are, are in these sectors. So for UNDP, this crisis, the context of the crisis um, is really an opportunity to discuss maybe some old measures that were in the parking lots, but that now we can revamp and we can discuss if, if we left this kind of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of policies, but now is the time to, to revamp them. So we, we think in UNDP we are developing and modeling the costing that uh, implied by the implementation of temporary basic income across uh, 100, uh, I think, 20 countries. This, uh, this TBI is a form of, of guaranteed basic income, so um, it's provided to those under a minimum income threshold. So it's not the universal basic, basic income, it's targeted. And, and the goal is to ensure that population enjoys this minimum income level to have, let's say, if you want, dignity. So, so um, what, what we think is the potential to address uh, the economic impact of COVID in women is if these kind of measures are not 
given at the household level rather than at the individual level. So this will be a very, very powerful uh, uh, way of promoting women's agents and reduce their economic dependence and give them the opportunity to many times escape for abusive relationships. I, I wanted to put on the table for discussion of all of you this kind of measure because here there, we see also the potential of redefining the social contract. So, so I, I wanted to share with you that a gender responsive economic recovery, and I will finish here, there is a need for coordination between all actors. Coordinated actions are the ones that can make a difference, and, and that's the reason for this webinar. So, for instance, targeting redistribution of care work within households, provision of universal basic uh, services, or active employment policies, policies targeting social norms, that for UNDP is also at the core of, of the work, uh, to address uh, inequalities. All of these packets cannot happen if we do not sit all together. Civil society, government, uh, uh, international organizations, and, and, and the actors that are in charge of, of, of the decisions. So I will stop here. I will just give you some examples from other countries to land and to, to become like a to, to have the opportunity to discuss more concrete measures uh, in the second session. For instance, in Portugal, they, regu they have regularized uh, uh, domestic workers and all migrant workers. Uh, in Spain, temporal class transfer has been approved for domestic workers also. A minimal vitamin income also has been approved in Spain for sexual exploitation victims parental leaves, urgent childcare in South Korea. So there are many, many measures and I, I, will, I look forward listening to uh, um, the experiences that in the next session they are going to share. I will stop here and thank you so much for the opportunity of being engaged in this conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Lagunas for for uh, proposing very specific policy areas and some good ex examples from around the world on topical areas of work. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, we have heard in the opening remarks from the three hosting organizations uh, about uh, the challenges and what could the future hold, the opportunities in front of us for addressing pre-existing things that have always been on the table, which is the uh, household responsibilities of women and the care burden and the care economy, social protection, digital divide, etc. Now we are moving into the first session, which is entitled Gender Equality Perspectives in Government COVID-19 Response Measures. And I have the pleasure to introduce Her Excellency the, min the Minister of Women, Family, Children and Seniors from the Government of Tunisia, Ms. H, uh, uh, Ms. Asma Sheri Labadi. So, uh, Your Excellency, we have, if I may pose a question to you, we have all been following with great interest the measures that Tunisia has been, has been proposing in, in this time for the empowerment of women. And we have seen your focus on women in vulnerable women, women in the informal economy. Can you provide for us some outline of what you have done? Uh, and tell us what are the remaining challenges as well and how you would like to go forward as a country? Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you for the invitation and also thank you for this initiative uh, by the three organizations which will open the space for everybody uh, in the MENA region to discuss first about the challenges that different countries face pertaining uh, the um, COVID-19 crisis or pandemic, whether social or economic uh, aspects for the women, and also 
to talk about uh, the uh, solution that we need to foresee to have a national policy and maybe even uh, mutual regional policies to face this challenge because we are the officials that are responsible to, um, to plan policies and draw policies and maybe in the next period, maybe for tens of years, unfortunately, just like a lot of organizations are saying that the period of a pandemic or the disease are different aspects uh, it could be uh, in health aspects because the health viruses can develop and can be of different uh, types and also on the other aspects which is the economy and the other one is social <coughs> sorry and so we need to have strategies a proactive strategy is there a problem pertaining the uh, translation her Excellency is asking. There is no problem with the uh, translation, so I can continue. Okay, thank you. So I said that we need to have a space for discussing at the national level, at the regional level, supported by different uh, um, national organizations, just like the ones we are having now in this webinar. So we were able uh, to foresee or to be uh, prepared uh, for such a crisis that uh, the world wasn't prepared for, uh, to, sorry, uh, whether uh, uh, about women or any other category in this society. In fact, um, uh, Tunisia was no exception um, from a lot of other countries containing uh, facing the pandemic COVID-19 and maybe there are some countries that have succeeded to Tunisia in this uh, experience. So this gave us some time and some capacity to have a preempted um, procedures to limit uh, the uh, consequences of this pandemic. So um, thanks uh, to the procedures that were taken like, for example, closing the border and having some uh, protective procedures that were taken in schools or in public lives for the citizens. This made us um, control the pandemic uh, health wise, or at least our experience could be considered successful. Like, after four months, and uh, of the time of this crisis, uh, the, the cases of COVID-19 in Tunisia till now is about one, uh, 1,200, more than 1,050 of them, they were recovered, totally recovered. And um, casualties for a month were only 50 cases. So this is about the procedures that uh, were taken health-wise and they resulted in, in good, um, uh, good um, situations. So Tunisia can be considered uh, in a good situation health-wise. Um, uh, along with those procedures, we had some economic procedures and we focused on the fragile categories uh, so that uh, they wouldn't uh, suffer more um, uh, due to COVID-19. And women was in the core of these or those uh, procedures, whether in the economic aspect or social aspect. In this respect, I would like to give you some of the procedures taken by the government um, in different uh, sectors. And then I will talk about the specific sectors taken by the Ministry of uh, women, family, child, and uh, seniors in Tunisia, they were specific um, uh, procedures uh, that tackled specific categories. Um, procedures taken by the government to limit the uh, consequences of uh, the COVID 19 pandemic. In this respect, I need to mention that Tunisia, just like any other country, most of the countries, women is considered um, 
females where the uh, percentage is considered uh, high in uh, the public sector and also in the other sector. In uh, the public sector, it is 60 percent. In the industrial sector, uh, the women is also more than 60 percent. Uh, the women in the health sector and the semi health sector also women is like in the uh, pharmaceutical uh, sector uh, it's about 70 percent and the um, in the rest of the health sector is also more than 50 percent and it also to mention that in this respect we have some strategies and measures for the benefits of the sectors that are mostly affected by COVID-19 because activities were suspended in the factories or uh, um, uh, farm projects were also suspended and uh, some other sectors that were uh, affected. In this respect, the government said some of the sectors like they are giving some financial monthly assistance for the workers. Um, by a grant to grant each worker with 200 uh, Tunisian dinars uh, to maintain uh, the sustainability of those uh, industrial institutions. And uh, this included um, the uh, sectors of the factories that uh, have uh, more than 50% of their workers from women. Also, uh, they uh, supported uh, the low income families or uh, those um, fragile uh, households uh, and this is by giving them uh, monthly grants among those families their only supporter could be a woman a woman that supports the whole family or the breadwinner of those families is a woman and this uh, included one million eight hundred thousand households that enjoyed uh, such support and this uh, uh, support continued for three months and um, delivering their uh, finance uh, assistance the limited income uh, households uh, those families had only one breadwinner who was a woman or um, they could have both men and women working but they had very limited income and um, also uh, having the women in the front line to control uh, the consequences um, of uh, COVID-19 pandemic, like in the health sector and the health um, sector. Um, she was in the hospital, so she was in the clinic. She was within the teams that uh, dealt with the patients. Uh, most of those teams do consist uh, uh, of a majority of women. And so there were some procedures and measures taken to protect their teams to protect them from uh, getting infected and uh, there were also a number of measures taken for the benefit of the institutions that work in, uh, in other sectors that were affected by the COVID-19 uh, and those measures were taken to ensure their sustainability and also to uh, assure the workers of their institutions to uh, have uh, to have their salaries or wages, and this included some institutions of taking uh, um, care of seniors and uh, elderly people, and, and um, this sector included women uh, that worked in those institutions, and they. Uh, uh, they uh, were very much affected uh, by COVID-19 because the work uh, was suspended either because they didn't have uh, uh, a transportation or a possible transportation to those institutions or due to the confinement uh, that we had uh, to impose in uh, the time of COVID-19. So the ministry uh, established a financing line uh, to uh, support uh, those uh, caregivers uh, that work in uh, some households and uh, the demand or the request that we received were about uh, 2,000 and we responded to all of them uh, by enabling those women or granting them uh, some financial support. 
um, they could refund it, uh, but uh, we didn't impose any conditions or, or any um, uh, difficult uh, conditions. At the same time, um, we also tackled uh, the kindergarten sector. We know that uh, the women uh, uh, women work in this sector by a percentage of 97 percent. Um, they either have a, a high level of education or maybe some specialized in specific areas. And we also established a financing line for the benefit of those institutions and for the benefit of the seniors working in this sector. So that they may have some uh, funds that assure them um, that they can continue working, especially uh, for the kindergartens that are affiliated with some uh, uh, institutions. We know that kindergarten, most of them, if not all of them, um, uh, uh, such institutions are uh, um, dedicated for women. So uh, the ministry was keen uh, to sustain this, uh, these institutions for the benefit of women uh, that either work uh, in those institutions or have their kids there. And the percentage of uh, the funds uh, was uh, given to those institutions where was 80 percent and we resources all the women that and for financial, financial uh, and uh, by this um, um, they could continue or resume their work uh, since the beginning of July. Uh, at the same time, in the framework, uh, at the same time, uh, we could assist as the rural women uh, that work in the um, farming uh, sector, and we know that uh, uh, I couldn't get the percentage or, uh, of the workers that work in the farming sector are for women, and we have to intervene so that we can uh, deliver some protection for them uh, so they wouldn't get infected uh, with the uh, COVID 19 virus. And we also uh, we were also able uh, to, uh, to distribute their products. Uh, so, in this way, the farming sector wasn't. Um, highly affected by COVID 19 in Tunisia. Uh, so, based on the different measures taken, directed for the benefit uh, or for the interest of the institutions. Some institutions we were, um, uh, we were concerned that they are going to be mostly affected by the uh, COVID 19 pandemic. Um, and they would uh, eventually affect the workforce. So we had to intervene for the interest of these institutions by um, a finance, um, by a financing line or financing budget uh, delivered to them within the framework of uh, creating a, a national strategy so that we would be able to control any new wave of this pandemic and also to be prepared for any other crisis that uh, Tunisia may face um, in the future. We are currently at the ministerial level uh, and also in cooperation with other ministries um, to integrate uh, to also think the team uh, uh, gender in our plan for 2025 uh, so that all the programs that are going to be adapted and uh, that are going to be taken by all the ministries um, all these uh, uh, policies are going to take into consideration um, gender equality. Uh, also, we are working uh, to, uh, also, we are currently working on the limitation of the uh, effects of COVID 19 um, on, on the institutions, and specifically for these institutions, actually, their female workers, like in the tourism sector or in the factories sector that have a lot of women. Uh, female workers uh, there's a risk that those women uh, lose uh, their uh, jobs. So we are working on a new mechanism that enable women who may lose their jobs to work in some other or a new uh, productive sector to sustain their resource, their source of income. Um, and those programs include uh, some uh, training the programs, uh, some rehabilitation programs, so that they, uh, so that they would be able to work in a uh, different sector. In this case, respect, uh, we um, made a lot of progress. Uh, progress, uh, sorry, uh, to um, uh, to uh, to transform some uh, the um, uh, 
um, national uh, projects or businesses uh, owned by women uh, into uh, SMEs for women. And uh, we have a program that finances uh, these projects in a, in a way that could be sustainable in case they face any economic crisis or any health crisis uh, that would have uh, health supporters. Uh, because we noticed uh, that uh, the uh, small and medium um, enterprises will not be able to confront and to face a such big uh, pandemic. So we thought that uh, we can gather those small, uh, small projects, small entrepreneurship in one big project that could be able uh, to face uh, any pandemic. And we worked uh, on a social and uh, economic uh, uh, solidarity project. Uh, so we can move from small, those small projects into structures, uh, big uh, projects that can uh, be resilient in such uh, times. And uh, we are also working for the future to provide some mechanisms to develop the SMEs of women, to, uh, to develop uh, the small enterprises of women, to medium uh, enterprises of women, especially in, um, in the industrial sector and uh, the educational sector. Uh, there were uh, some legal uh, regulations that were established lately in um, uh, Tunisia just like um, following the measures taken for any startups, also um, you know, some other procedures um, for the self-run um, businesses uh, to be developed into a medium a project and uh, may even be uh, a big uh, business and, and this would encourage those institutions to continue. Uh, we are also uh, working on providing assistance for uh, social insurance for the benefits of the sectors in which women work. But uh, they are, uh, currently, uh, they lack uh, the social um, coverage in the farming sector. The social, uh, social insurance is very weak, um, especially for women that work in farms. Um, so, in the coordination with the Ministry of uh, Social Affairs, we are working on establishing a system for social insurance, and social protection, and health care for uh, the interests of those women that may face uh, work injuries or some illnesses, uh, but they don't have any social uh, coverage or any social insurance that guarantee for them uh, the uh, health services. And um, in this respect, uh, in order this system may guarantee more rights for the women that work in the farming sector and would also um, maintain their dignity in the times, in the hard times and in the times of uh, crisis. We also, um, we are working on a system that uh, maintain and to protect the rights of uh, the, um, the uh, health care that uh, work in the household and their number are uh, very large in Tunisia. It's about 40,000. Uh, 40,000 to up to 60,000 women that work in the sector, but they lack the um, social coverage, they lack the health service, they lack the protection for the minimum wage, they lack the right um, uh, to, they lack, uh, they lack also uh, to, um, to maintain their job in times uh, like uh, the time of COVID-19. And so that's why we are trying to fill in this gap by having a legal framework in this respect so that uh, they can be covered with all services. We are also working on uh, establishing a platform and uh, a comprehensive system that enables women to market their products in Tunisia, but not, also, not only in Tunisia, but also on a regional level, because we were successful to establish this framework that facilitates uh, funding those women uh, so they can market, uh, their, uh, market their
their product, but uh, uh, still the biggest difficulty they face uh, is uh, marketing their products uh, because uh, sometimes they find it very hard to find uh, places to market their products, whether it's uh, um, uh, whether it is uh, a farm a farm product or a handicraft or any industrial other product. That's why we are working on this project and it's a project that I wanted to share with you because it encourages the women um, and it can make her uh, reach um, and it makes her uh, be a decision maker and uh, even reach a point where she can control public policy and public decision making and this would um, guarantee uh, the gender mainstreaming and we are about uh, to have uh, uh, this uh, legal framework before the end of 2020. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about the Tunisian experience. I'm following up the other uh, intervention. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency, the Minister, for this uh, great uh, presentation. We could see how far Tunisia is now having different levels of inter intervention. We have the um, immediate uh, intervention, which is about protecting women, protecting families, uh, but uh, you have a very clear vision about uh, the uh, progress of women on the medium, um, on the um, medium range and on the long range too. Uh, thank you, and hopefully you will stay well with us for further uh, uh, questions. Now, the presentation from Egypt, which is uh, the uh, presentation of the uh, National uh, Council for Women, and um, uh, Dina Authority is going to represent uh, Ms. Uh, to her uh, when she talks about the procedures, the measures taken by Egypt, and what was uh, the uh, uh, role of the National Council. It's my very pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, I'm actually going to give you an, an overview about Egypt's rapid response to women's needs and women's situation during the COVID time. Uh, Egypt has actually issued, Egypt was the very first country to issue a policy note that considers women's needs, uh, that has suggestions, suggested policies and, measure, and measures to include or consider women's need during COVID times. Egypt was also the first country to issue a women policy practice to track all Egyptian uh, government's efforts uh, that are considered to women's needs and are gender sensitive during COVID time. Uh, let me tell you that we have uh, also uh, started to this the why, why women during COVID. And of course, as uh, lots of the speakers have already explained, let me give you some very brief numbers. Uh, in Egypt, we have, of course, 91% of the nursing staff uh, are uh, women. We have 42% of human doctors are women. We have 56.8% women working in the service sectors. And we have 18% female heads of households. Uh, while we were drafting our policies, uh, we uh, have focused on the affected women segments. So our policies were focusing on women who are, of course, frontliners working in the medical sectors, women who have immune chronic uh, diseases or el women elderly, women with disabilities, women are, who are at the reproductive age. And of course, women working in the informal and the irregular uh, sectors and women working in the tourism sectors uh, as well. Uh, as you already know, the National Council for Women in Egypt is the a national women machinery who is entitled and mandated to uh, policy making, to legis proposing legislations and action planning in Egypt. And for the implementation part, we are uh, mandated to do awareness raising and uh, training and building the capacities. So our four uh, main uh, focused uh, areas are Number one, the human, uh, the impact on human endowment. The impact on human endowment, this pillar actually includes all matters related to health, education, social protection, and mental health uh, to include the uh, psychological uh, trainings and sessions, especially to women who are, of course, taking all the care burden uh, 
as well as other burdens given the, the, the pandemic. The second pillar Oh, the second focus area is uh, women voice and agency. So the women voice and agency pillar focuses on all violence against women related uh, topics. Uh, of course, given the COVID, uh, the, the domestic violence, uh, also the FGM and the increase and the potential increase in the ch child marriage, given that uh, some girls, um, given that the education was suspended for a little bit, so some girls will not be able to go to school, so they might be uh, subjected to uh, early marriage and the women voice and agency of course uh, the other pillar in it uh, the other component in this pillar is uh, the leadership so women taking leadership leadership positions participating in the decision making process of anything that has to do with the containment measures of the COVID-19 that also must be included to make sure that women's needs are in uh, every and each policy that is going to be uh, issued uh, by the Egyptian government. We have the third pillar, the impact on uh, economic opportunities, which focuses on all the economic uh, related initiatives that are taken by the government to contain the, uh, the repercussions of the, uh, of the pandemic. And uh, the fourth and the last pillar is promoting data and knowledge, which is of course a very most important pillar so that we can move forward this actually pillar is of course uh, is dynamic uh, because the, the 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 numbers are changing uh, constantly at all times so these are the four uh, main focus areas that egypt are uh, focusing on and suggested to focus on uh, during the pandemic actually the egyptian government uh, has uh, has made a very good uh, excellent actually uh, achievements uh, when it comes to considering uh, women's needs during the COVID. Uh, the readiness of the Egyptian government is a very, very strong baseline to why or how we could achieve uh, those efforts. Actually, uh, just yesterday, we have issued our fourth edition of the Women Policy Tracker. The Women Policy Tracker is a tool that NCW has worked on. We established this tool to, uh, to uh, include all Egyptian government's policies, decisions, or measures that have been taken uh, with a gender lens. Uh, actually, uh, just yesterday, we have launched uh, the fourth edition, which uh, included 106 measures take, take given uh, or taken by the government of Egypt that are uh, considered to women's needs. Uh, of course, uh, I'm going to take you through some of those measures uh, that have been uh, very, very, uh, um, that had a very great impact on ground uh, on women. Um, actually, of course, uh, the, the, fina the financial transfer, the financial cash transfer to women was a very important thing. Of course, the president has, uh, the president of Egypt, his excellency president of Egypt, has announced a compensation, financial cash transfer, transfer of 500 Egyptian pounds to the informal sector at large and we have uh, worked on that uh, with 40 percent of the women who have benefited from this uh, compensation were uh, women uh, there has been a raise to the medical staff also announced by his excellency president of Egypt that his excellency the prime minister have issued exceptional uh, leave to the mothers of children less than 12 years old and to the uh, mothers of children with disabilities for as long as the partial lockdown was there. Uh, we have also, the, the Ministry of Social Solidarity have uh, expanded the social protection program. There is a famous social mega social protection program in Egypt called the Careful and Karama. Uh, this program has 89% uh, of the program that this is before the, the COVID pandemic, 89% of the program beneficiaries are women. So actually when this was a very strong baseline to start with, so the Takeful and Karama social protection program has expanded to 100, more than even 160,000 uh, new families so they can also cope with the repercussions of this uh, pandemic. Uh, a rural, the rural women leaders, salary has announced to increase from 350 Egyptian pounds monthly to 900 Egyptian pounds monthly and uh, of course the digitization is also a very important uh, aspect uh, the training programs to enhance women empowerment raise their capacities to do their own businesses has been digitized such as uh, using different kinds of tools and training programs 
actually um, the Prime, His Excellency Prime Minister has uh, formed a committee to, uh, to deal with all the uh, informal sector and to uh, organize the, uh, the issuance of the compensation, the financial cash trans transfer to the Egyptian public. And uh, this was a high level uh, committee and the National Council for Women was one of, uh, member of this committee, which actually is an example to uh, including women's needs into uh, consideration while drafting any policies that affect women. And it is also an example of the importance of women's participation in the leadership positions and in the uh, mechanisms issued to uh, serve uh, women. We also have uh, awareness raising programs that were targeting the social stigma because this was also a very important uh, aspect that's been there, been there. We have awareness raising programs that uh, has uh, targeted how to um, do uh, marital counseling uh, because of course, the uh, domestic, uh, all the family problems and issues has occurred given uh, the uh, lockdown and the uh, program, for instance, called Mawadda of the Ministry of Social Solidarity has been also digitized to reach out to people at their homes. Uh, other also um, NGOs uh, have issued uh, uh, an awareness raising videos in cooperation with the National Council for Women, for women and other stakeholders. Um, to talk about how to deal with the psychological burden and the pressure uh, of, uh, that the women take uh, given the uh, consequences of this uh, pandemic. We have also uh, the Financial Regulatory Authority in Egypt has also announced uh, rescheduling and trying to ease the installments of the microfinance loans to uh, microfinance project owners. Also, we have done a very uh, small survey uh, to, uh, to determine the numbers of the violence against women increase in Egypt. That's what, this was actually done in partnership with UN Women as well, UN Women and Basira uh, Center. And uh, this, was, um, this survey was done uh, in bet between the days of 4th to the 14th of April in uh, 2020, of course, we have uh, very pre preliminary findings that can give us indicators to the increase of violence against women uh, due, uh, due to the COVID. We have 77% uh, violence uh, from the husband. We have 33% family problems. We have 19% uh, violence uh, between family members at large. And we have 94% of the family members were aware of the uh, precautionary, precautionary measures that were needed uh, to um, protect, uh, being protected from uh, COVID-19. We have 72% uh, of the families has uh, told us that their income has been affected uh, after the COVID hit Egypt. Hit Egypt. Also, uh, the Ministry of uh, International Cooperation has been also uh, signing and dedicated projects for the social and economic, env uh, economic empowerment of women uh, as also the intermediate and long-term measures so they can uh, also uh, recover easily in the future. And uh, the National Council for Women has actually a national office and we have 27 branches all over the governments of Egypt. We have a representative to the National uh, Complaints Office within uh, our branches and through that we have received th around 34,000 inquiry uh, on our uh, hotline, on the National Complaints Office hotline uh, during the COVID time. This is of course a, a big number. Uh, however, almost 80% of those inquiries were related to economic, uh, economic uh, uh, yani inquiries on uh, or uh, economic complaints on uh, the situation, etc. Almost all of those uh, inquiries uh, were either answered or any problem were referred to the concerned agency, whether uh, to the concerned agency, whether it was the Ministry of Social Solidarity or the uh, cabinet, so they can get enrolled into the government services. Also, very lately, we have uh, reactivated, Egypt has reactivated, the National Council for Women actually has reactivated the uh, National uh, Citizenship uh, Project, which is a project that issues the ID cards for, uh, for women 
for free. Actually, this was a very, very important intervention because women who do not have ID cards cannot get access to the government services that are provided to protect women uh, or from uh, during uh, COVID. So we actually reactivated this, taking into consideration, of course, all the precautionary measures uh, that uh, are needed uh, to be uh, taken. And this is also activated through all our 27 uh, branches all over the governments of Egypt. Actually, let me tell you uh, concerning the uh, future things or the things that we are currently uh, working on. Uh, we have also uh, worked on strengthening the technological infrastructure. Uh, because, uh, of course, um, the National Council for, Women's, for Women, inst for instance, had um, the campaigns, on-ground campaigns, etc. And given the situation of the partial lockdown, we had to transform all our uh, work on the technological platform. So let me tell you one thing that we have, uh, we had a very strong baseline. That's why we could easily enhance the technological uh, platforms, uh, digitize uh, most of our uh, work. Uh, we have also uh, worked on, um, for, for instance, women in the uh, latest uh, CAPMIS uh, data, we uh, have gathered the, 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 the information published and we have 60% of women use phones and 26% of women use laptops and 25 use computers. So actually women's use of technology uh, or uh, phones or um, digitized, digitized uh, uh, means are not uh, low actually. That's why for instance, the compensation and the direction was to open uh, e-wallets. And this is one uh, other important aspect to open e-wallets for the women on the ground so they can we can send them immediately and timely and effectively the uh, compensation or the financial cash transfer on the ground uh, also it is very very important to enhance and digitize all the means to uh, help women uh, through the msmes and of course uh, we have to uh, work on the gender mainstreaming also to encourage the private sector to retain their employees and the gender mainstreaming aspect within whether the government or within the private sector, etc. And uh, this is uh, it. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions or inquiries. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, um, uh, Ms. El Serafi. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are running late. But so I will take uh, one, one question, if Her Excellency the Minister is still with us and if uh, Mrs. Dina is uh, willing to answer. And uh, let me pose this question uh, in Arabic. Ma'ali um, al-Wazira, Her Excellency the Minister, if you're still with us, the question is, what is the role of the private sector? Or what is the role of the... Uh, civil society uh, to make a decision pertaining to the COVID-19 pandemic and also in respect of uh, designing programs. Quickly. I'm sorry, Bessa, um, I didn't hear correctly. Can the question, you the question is, what is the role in developing the response to the COVID-19, the policy response, what was the role of the private sector and what was the role of civil society? Did they participate in the response and did they participate in the um, planning for the programs? Of course, thank you very much. Yes, as I have explained, the civil society, uh, let me talk, for instance, about the National uh, Council for Women. The National Council for Women in Egypt has a platform for civil society. We have a civil society forum that has the more than 50 uh, civil society partners on ground, actually. The civil society uh, or the, the NGOs actually in Egypt have, uh, several NGOs have been working with us on several uh, different initiatives one of which was uh, the uh, awareness raising on the domestic violence and the awareness raising on the uh, uh, psychological pressure, how to handle pressure, how to handle uh, this. Also, 
the, uh, the, the private sector's uh, role is very, very important in my opinion. We need to uh, work uh, with the private sector to include, make them have gender mainstreaming policies to start with within their organizations and of course to spread that among their partners as well. Please thank let you. me know anything else. Thank you so much. So, thank you very much. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will move to session two, which is actually hearing from the private sector and hearing from civil society organization about their own assessment, uh, their role, and what they think of the government policies. So, uh, our, we will have uh, three panelists. I will, uh, I will name them uh, with the role of the speakers. Mr. Ahmed Haj. He is the CEO of the National Bank uh, of Palestine. This will be, uh, he will be telling us about the role of uh, the Palestinian uh, Central Bank. Uh, this is followed by Nisreen Salti, who will be talking to us about a study she has done on the um, financial and social uh, and labor market impact of the COVID-19 on Lebanese women. And finally, uh, Ms. Lina Abu Habib, will, which, who will also describe to us the uh, approach uh, and role of civil society organization in Lebanon. So, uh, Mr. Hajj, the floor is yours. Hello, good, good evening to all. Good evening, Dr. Mary. Thank you for having me. Good evening. Ahlan wa uh, just to clarify things, uh, I don't want to get in trouble with the regulatory authority. I'm the manager of the National Bank, which is a commercial bank in Palestine. Oh, okay, the I misunderstood. <laughs> the Palestine Apologies for this. And I think some of them are attending today, so... Uh -huh. <laughs> it's because in Jordan, the, the central bank played a very critical role, so I thought Palestine would be the same. Please go ahead. Yeah, so you well, are actually, also Palestine in Palestine. The of course, the monetary authority, Palestine Monetary Authority, which is an, the equivalent of a central bank, of course, plays the major role in the banking industry. Uh, I will try today to give you an idea about the situation in Palestine in general, very briefly, because I just found out that it's very similar to the region. The challenges are similar, and the consequences of the COVID-19 outbreak was also similar. Some of the ideas I wanted to share with you, previous speakers has already talked about, uh, about how women were affected, and even the reactions were very similar. Uh, then I will try to show you how could the private sector help, in our view, of course, in our humble experience, uh, and what were the measures taken by us to make the uh, internal environment uh, better for both, uh, especially for female, and how our response towards our community uh, targeted to reduce the effects of this pandemic in all the society and especially on female. Uh, in the beginning, in the pre-corona world, uh, we looked very similar to how the region looked. Uh, whether in the level of participation of women in, in the workforce, in the economy as a whole, uh, although probably we have higher rates of women uh, participation in education because when we reviewed the statistics a few years ago we found out that if 50 percent in all higher education students were were women and in some specialties it was even above 60 percent for us as a business institution that was a signal a clear signal how would be the workforce uh, in the future as as an equal opportunity employer we knew that the, the, the workforce will change. At that time, when we looked at the banking industry, um, around 20% of the employees were females. Currently, and we were similar to them. Currently, for example, we have 34% of our employees of female employees. That was a change that we did because we've seen where the future is going. On the, that's that's on, the, on, the, on the internal environment in the normal situation. Now, on the, uh, about how we are reacting to the community needs, whether it's environment, whether it's uh, women empowerment or any other issue. We believe that social responsibility should not, should not be a short-term initiative. 
that an institution just do to gain some publicity. The equation where that makes social responsibility initiatives continuous and sustainable is where a, a private sector institution can find an, an equilibrium where that initiative is, all, is also profitable. Five years ago, we launched our first female targeting product. It was a saving account called Hayati in Arabic. It was a playing on the words because it could mean my life or it could be my darling. So when we launched that product, it was the first idea. It was a first of its kind. But we were even surprised by the level of, uh, of acceptance of that. Currently, if we look at the, uh, at the banking industry as a, whole, as a whole, we find that 15% of clients are only females. They're, so the level of the, the financial inclusion for female in Palestine is very limited. At the National Bank, five years after that product, which was then uh, followed by other products that now we have a complete program, now we have 34% of our clients of women, which is the highest probably not only in Palestine and maybe in the region. And to, to tell you the truth, these are not losing accounts. These are accounts that are making money for the bank. So it was a, an equation where the equilibrium we could achieve. We, we are we are able to make profits from this segment, although it's much wider to be called a segment, we are, but we are able to make profits from this program and still provide help for women empowerment. The second decision was that a share of the profits that we are making should go back to the same segment, to the same cause. So we started four years ago to grant interest fee loans for women-owned projects. Currently, we are granting $1 million every year, and in some years, we had to double the amount because the demand was very high. And honestly, again, this was a profit-making business because the first loan was interest-free, and it was uh, given in parallel with technical assistance. But we found that these projects succeeded. Default rates were very low. Unfortunately, as a man, I say that default rates for females are much lower than males in Palestine. Men default more. Uh, obviously, women respect and are committed to the opportunity when it's given to them. So that was the situation pre-COVID-19. Now, when, during the outbreak, the outbreak that started in Palestine four months ago, uh, although in Palestine, I'm sure everybody knows, we are used to work in crisis, we are used to emergency situations, but we are not used to this kind of emergency situation. Even us who thought that we are ready, we can deal with any situation, we found that this is different. So different in two levels, and our reactions had to be done in two levels. In the work environment, it was different, On our reaction to the society, it was different. So, and for example, when we talk about the work environment, we found that during planning capital, uh, human capital, we thought, of course, about female-male uh, balance, but we never thought about who gives care at home. We never thought that, although the percentage is, as I said, almost third of our staff are female, but we didn't know whom of them should give care at home in such a situation, and who didn't. And despite that we gave an equal chance to give care at home for men and women, of course, as you know, the, the burden was on women. So the, the, the issue was how can we help our staff while keeping business continuity and keeping our role in the economy? Because we, we are not a small bank. We are the third largest bank operating in Palestine, the second uh, largest Palestinian bank. So, and there was a national decision that the financial industry should continue to operate because we are the ones that are helping all businesses and public sector to, to, to continue its operations. We are the ones who transfer the money for uh, the healthcare system to import, let's say, whatever supplies or medicine that they need. So we needed to stay operating all the time. So we had to find creative solutions that allowed our uh, caregivers uh, to, to, to stay at home for the longest time possible. And banks are not known for promoting working from home because of 
the security issues because we are traditional as banks and because of the cash treatment. So not all functions could be done from home, even if we wanted. So we, have, we, gave, uh, we gave initiatives, for example, we allowed uh, the mothers that have, uh, that have children at home because all schools were closed, double the paid leave that they could, of course, and we gave them priority over men and non-married women, in that case, uh, the priority to take a leave in the first place. Of course, we had also before them to give paid leave for all those who have health conditions that made them uh, more vulnerable to, to COVID-19. Fortunately, uh, our staff is young, so the number of people we had to, to give the leave, and I'm talking unfortunately not because we don't want to give too many people uh, paid leaves, but because we wanted to maintain business continuity, as I told you. So we passed this phase, and now uh, the, the challenge was how to, uh, to continue operations and treat our clients. The, and the first answer was digital services. Uh, we were trying to expand digital services, the amount of services that we are providing. As every other modern bank in the, in the region or in the world, we, were, we had the internet banking. We had the first of its kind in the region of uh, a digital service center where a client can do transactions or inquire about his transactions or his accounts from any social media, for example, through Facebook, WhatsApp, or whatever. Or whatever. So we, we extended the hours for that uh, of work for the digital service center. And we introduced services for the first time while trying to maintain the healthy uh, and safe environment for the, the workers on this, uh, in this service center. That was a challenge because God forbid, if one of them was infected, you know, we will have to close the whole center. So we had to divide the headquarters into two headquarters, team A and team B. And we had to divide the shifts to shorter shifts, but longer hours. So more employees were trained quickly, more services were added quickly to enable clients. Our target was to have the maximum amount of control for the clients over their accounts and funds without having to come to the bank. Besides providing a, uh, a safe environment within the branches if the client chose to come to the to the branch now uh, besides that now the long-term reaction was how would we react because to to the effects of the crisis of course the crisis was was uh, complex because it was a local crisis it came after bad conditions 2019 we witnessed uh, an economic slowdown because some of the uh, measures that the Israeli occupation have took, the uh, public fund uh, finance was affected, the government was in deficit, the ability of the government to provide help was very limited, and we left 2019, even before the pandemic, in a weak situation. So private sector had to play a bigger role in Palestine. There was a fund, the fund was called in Arabic, I don't know how to translate that, but it was a stand of dignity probably, that pulled the funds from, uh, from the private sector as similar to an experience, similar experience in Jordan, I believe, uh, to help uh, the government in covering the needs of the society during the pandemic. Uh, by the choice of the, His Excellency the Prime Minister, our chairman was the head of the fund, so that put extra responsibility on us as a bank to support so we were not only providing by donating as, uh, as the National Bank Group, because we, are, uh, we have two banks, we have the Palestine Islamic Bank and the National Bank in the group. So besides providing that donation, we provided the technical assistance for the fund also. We provided the help through our call center, we provided the help through developing the website, we provided social media pages, and also the social, as I told you, the digital service center, we specified a seat in that uh, center to support uh, the, the, uh, the fund to raise funds from the private sector. Now, regarding our own reaction towards our own clients, as I told you before, pre-corona, we had more than a third of our clients as female clients. 
And unfortunately, as all the speakers before me said, they were affected more than the other segments because they were working in, in sectors that has been affected even more. Uh, healthcare, uh, preschool, all these were affected even, even worse than the others. So we, we are reacting now by two things. On the national level, there was a fund that the Palestine Monitor Authority has established, has launched, a $300 million fund to finance uh, SMEs. They did not specify a certain percentage for uh, female projects, but as a bank, because we will be one of the participants, we, we will give, uh, commit to the percentage of our female clients from the client base. So 34% of the funds that will be channeled through us from the 300 million will go to female projects. Now on our level, uh, we are doing two things. First one is, as I told you, for the interest-free loans, we are giving an additional grace period for these projects that will last until the beginning of 2021. So we are giving them another six months of grace period. They will not have to pay anything for that. We are allowing them to rearrange their businesses around the new situations. Because according to a survey that was conducted by UN Women, by, by the way, in Palestine, and if I can share quickly the numbers, 27% of the projects owned by women have stopped operations during the lockdown. 95% of them said that they have been affected negatively. And 73%, which is an important figure to me, 73% said that they could last, they could survive for a period between one month to four months. And now the four months had passed already. We are in July. And unfortunately, we are having in Palestine a second wave. We were among the first countries in the world to have a lockdown, but now we are facing a much uh, much higher rates of infection, and we are in lockdown again. So we are around the end of the period that women estimated they can survive their businesses through, the majority of them, almost three quarters of them. So without the support, we, uh, they will not survive, they will not continue. And these are our clients. So if they lose, we lose. So I'm not trying to make it as 100% social contribution. No, we are trying to protect the businesses that have been profitable for us in the past and we think we should invest in them in the long term. So the, uh, the National Bank Initiative currently is we are preparing uh, for- Mr. Hajj, if I may, uh, we are uh, running out of time actually. I'm really enjoying uh, your presentation. So if we can, uh... Um, you know, one minute, is one minute up. good enough? Even two, <laughs> three. Sorry okay. to interrupt. You. So the last initiative we are making right now is uh, uh, during the coming weeks we'll announce uh, that we're establishing a hundred million dollar fund that will target SMEs. Uh, we will try to handle the distressed uh, loans uh, that uh, for, for the uh, to help. The SMEs to survive during this pandemic, we will provide loans with reduced interest with a grace period of around six months because we don't think that things will get better even in six months, unfortunately. And as I said, at least 34% of the funds will be targeted to female owned projects. And if the percentage gets higher, we will allow it. Almost. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was uh, really uh, an enlightening presentation of the concrete action of what the private sector can do. So now we will move to uh, Nisreen Salti. And if I may ask that the presentation is uh, between five and uh, seven minutes, if it's possible, uh, Dr. Nisreen? Sure, sure. Please go no ahead. Problem. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all for this opportunity and thank you to all the previous speakers. Um, I have been involved with uh, work with UN Women on Lebanon, as, as uh, Mary just mentioned, uh, and it is part of the inspiration for what I will be talking about today, although that work is very specific to the economic crisis that Lebanon is undergoing, has been since late 2019, so it's not really about COVID 
quite yet. But an economic shock is an economic shock. So in that sense, what I'll be talking about today is uh, relevant uh, to Lebanon as well, and maybe inspired partly by by our findings for Lebanon. So. Um, I, what I mean, I share um, uh, Ahmed's uh, initial uh, sort of uh, uh, disposition, which is a lot has been said. Uh, so I don't want to repeat a lot of what has been said, uh, but I want to, uh, if I could, actually share my screen with you to show you just a few. Um, I hope this works. If you can see my screen here, just to show you, uh, just uh, just to go through various aspects of life before uh, the pandemic, uh, and show the extent, the pervasiveness, and the depth of inequity on a gender basis. So, and this is just a small sampling of, of measures of well-being that I selected. Uh, but there are many, many more, right? So labor market statistics, we've already heard this. Unemployment rates for females is three times that of males. For the youth, it's double the male equivalent. Unpaid work, uh, already mentioned by Juan earlier, 4.7 times what uh, unpaid work done by males. Uh, inf uh, informal work in agriculture, much more feminine. Uh, but even in education, uh, yes, there have been great accomplishments great strides in education, in STEM, in tertiary education, but there's still an inequity. Uh, the share of public to private school enrollment is much higher among girls. And this is for the for select countries or for the entire region. Uh, food insecurity among female-headed households, always higher than among male-headed households. And of course, the digital divide, uh, the internet access. Uh, this is one of the statistics of the digital divide. All this to say, all this to say that we start at a basis of pervasive, uh, very widespread, very ingrained inequity, which in some sense, ironically, makes the intervention a little bit easier, a little bit more obvious, which is that if women are this concentrated on the vulnerable end, on the precarious end of any metric, right, then really, any social protection agenda will also reduce the gender gap, right? So anything we do that's progressive is going to help us at least reduce the disparity between men and women, even if that's not the initial aim. And this sort of resonates with a lot of what has been described as the very impressive government initiatives uh, uh, showcased by uh, Her Excellency the Minister of Tunisia. Uh, also, I think, Somebody is not muted. Okay. So, uh, and then uh, also. Um, Everybody mute, please. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, also the initiatives uh, in Egypt social safety net, food assistance, cash transfer programs, uh, primary health care, all the things we already do, uh, all the mechanisms, the machinations that already exist need to be activated. And yes, they have been largely, impressively activated by at least the two, um, the two initiatives that we heard about, uh, but then also all the multilateral initiatives that we've been hearing about. But what we haven't heard a lot about uh, is where does this support, where does this money come from for these social protection programs? This is a lot of spending. This is a lot of resources. And frankly, if we look at the flip side of this, this high concentration of vulnerability of women on every metric is also because of the revenue structure of government. It's not just how the government is spending and, what the, and how it should be spending to try to correct these inequities. It's also where the government gets its money and the way it does actually exacerbates our gender gaps. So this is not necessarily um, a terrain for immediate action because, you know, for reforming government revenue structures is not something that can happen overnight. But we do, in almost every Arab country, have over-reliance on indirect taxation, which are regressive. And again, if you think that women are concentrated among the more vulnerable segments of society, then they are bearing, they are among the, sec the sections of society bearing more of the toll of taxes. Personal income taxes are progressive, but only very, very marginally so for most countries. Uh, corporate tax exemptions that collect 
protect political interests are very rampant in the Arab world. And so uh, as we beef up our programs of social protection, as we make these funds available to correct some of these inequities, we also have to think about where this money is coming from and how these, the revenue generation in the medium run should be corrected towards more progressive systems that also extract less from women in order to spend on these, uh, on these programs. Because as, as things stand, women are also paying more for this social protection. Um, and so that's basically going to be the, the, the brevity of my intervention um, to try to bring this other angle to the discussion here, which is the fiscal side um, on the revenue side. I'm also happy to answer any questions about the Lebanon case and the specifics of the economic crisis in the Q&A um, or on the chat. And thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much, Nasreen, for bringing in the issue of uh, the importance of uh, fiscal policy uh, and the uh, importance for uh, tax reforms. I would say this is the most difficult time to start reforming taxes, but it is the elephant in the room for most of the Arab countries. I tell you, it is all... Uh, uh, indirect taxes right now, and that is what is uh, creating our um, um, financial instability. And, and, and uh, so, thank you so much, and thank you so much for being also short. I would like to tell everybody that we will be 10 minutes late or 15 minutes late, just to let you know. If the uh, interpreters are fine with that, the organizers will uh, let me know if the interpreters are fine with that. Uh, because it has been such a rich discussion, it was very hard for me to tell any of you uh, to speak less. So now we will finally move in the second session before we move on to the final concluding session to uh, Lina Abu Habib. Um, so, uh, Lina, if you can tell us a bit about the role of uh, civil societies uh, and do you think there is a momentum for change right now with all um, your work in civil society, not just in Lebanon, but also in the Arab region? Go ahead, Lina. Lina, are you there? Okay. It seems I think Lina is not with us. So if you don't mind, um, uh, I will see if we have some, I doubt that we have time for questions. I don't know if the organizers want to, want to inter intervene now and tell me something, but it is, uh, uh, five minutes to the time. So why don't we move now to the uh, uh, closing remarks. This has been uh, a very interesting session and I would like to thank the panelists for all their interventions and it has been really thought provoking from uh, specific policy measures to... Uh, Maybe. Yes, Lena's there, finally. <laughs> I've been here all the time, I know, but Please, Lena, you... go ahead. Very glad to see you. Yes. You <laughs> have five to, to seven well. minutes. Oh, I know. I won't take too much time, actually, out of respect to the participant and to the interpreters. Lena, I think we're not hearing you. You can't hear It's uh, you are really breaking. Try again because we really want to hear about civil society. Okay, colleagues, I think we lost Lina. This was going to be a very interesting uh, 
presentation that actually wraps up the macro and the micro and the private sector and the government role with the role of civil society. Uh, it's too bad that technology happens to fail, fail us uh, once in a while. I also uh, know that Lena has been working with the women's organization in the Arab region for so long and I'm sure she had uh, great insights for us. Anyway, so I, I, we have uh, now two, uh, I would like to introduce two speakers uh, who will give us uh, our uh, closing remarks. The first will be uh, His Excellency Masaki Noke. He is extraordinary and plenipotentiary of Japan to the Republic of Egypt. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, Ambassador, would you like to start? Uh, thank you very much, Madam Minister. Uh, I, I really miss the uh, intervention by the CSO representative, but uh, I really enjoyed uh, this seminar. And uh, I would like to thank again the three uh, development partners, which are OECD, UNDP, and UN Women, and uh, together with wonderful uh, speakers. And uh, well, uh, honestly, uh, uh, I, I personally found a lot of uh, uh, common points um, that the uh, people uh, in this region uh, are facing um, the same challenges and, uh, uh, and the uh, efforts uh, compared with Japan. Although there are differences of degrees, but many of the points raised are, are common uh, to Japan too. And so, in this sense, I enjoyed this uh, uh, webinar uh, very much. And I'm not here to summarize, but the, uh, uh, I, I, I thought the Tunisian and the Egyptian uh, governmental action uh, were very useful to understand uh, COVID-specific and non-COVID-specific uh, measures to, to, to tackle the, the gender issue. And I also enjoyed the uh, Palestinian banks uh, efforts for their staff and also for their business. And the uh, Nisleen's uh, intervention about the, uh, especially focusing on the uh, revenue structure uh, uh, was, uh, was very interesting and eye-opening for me. Uh, some takeaways. First, uh, the COVID-19 uh, reminded us how vulnerable the human beings are. So uh, I believe it demonstrates more than ever the importance of the concept of the human security. Uh, so we should focus on the individuals and to uh, understand and cope with uh, the, uh, the fears and uh, uh, deficiencies uh, people are facing uh, and uh, tackle those issues through a human-centered and multi-dimensional uh, partnership. And the COVID-19 uh, affects everybody uh, but evidently, uh, women are more seriously affected uh, at home and at the workplace. And at the workplace, many women are suffering from revenue reductions and job losses due to insecure and informal employment. Excepting probably in healthcare and social service sectors, but where uh, as majority of female workers, uh, they are exposed to a greater risk of the virus infection. At home, women have to carry a heavier loads of domestic works to take care of the children, uh, schools being shut, and uh, aiding family members, if any. And also, they suffer more frequently the gender-based violence uh, due to uh, the uh, stress and the unemployment and other factors. Uh, there is also, what, what should I say? Uh, those, some of those uh, problems we are living together with the Egyptians because evidently uh, so, uh, we have an embassy, we work with the Egyptians and we have to deal with the Egyptian staff. Um, Probably more often the female uh, staff uh, have difficulties. Uh, they have to take care of the children and the aiding father or mothers. So we have to give uh, more flexibility uh, to their work style. 
So uh, I, I, I found lots of common points uh, uh, compared with the experience of the uh, Palestinian uh, unbank. There is also some good news. We are more aware of the indispensable role of women, and not only in the healthcare and social service sectors due to the COVID-19. And we are finding a new work style, probably more friendly, potentially, to women, such as teleworking using ICT, which allows women to work at home, staying together with children and family members. So uh, globally, there are big challenges and some chances. And in order to take advantage of those uh, chances, uh, we have to work together, government, and through a partnership uh, with the uh, private sector and the civil uh, society. Uh, having said that, um, the next task is how to scale up those uh, good examples uh, we, we, we learned today and uh, further mainstream uh, gender sensitive and inclusive policy planning and implementation in spite of or rather thanks to uh, this COVID crisis. Um, each country has been working uh, based on their ownership but partnership is also indispensable between the public and the private sector, as well as among international partners. And as far as Japan is concerned, we strongly advocate for international cooperation to fight against COVID-19. And as an example, projects, total of 4.5 million US dollars, of which uh, 900,000 for the Arab region. And actually a one year project was launched last month to cover Iraq, Lebanon, and Palestine, um, taking into account the vulnerable healthcare system and the repercussions from prolonged conflict situations. And I'm happy to see uh, Lebanese and Palestinian friends together with us today. Uh, this is a modest project, but it has three objectives. First, to provide better access to essential protection mechanism for gender-based violence survivors by building capacities of hotlines and first responders, as well as remote counseling and technology-based services. Second, to mitigate the economic impacts on women and enhance their resilience for faster recovery by offering, uh, for some, offering cash for work opportunities, and for others, unconditional cash assistance. Third, to encourage gender-sensitive COVID-19 responses so that women are not only disproportionately affected, but play a leadership role in the planning and action. Gender has, has been one of the essential pillars of our development cooperation, and we have been promoting the rights, the capacity, and leadership role of women. And we have provided more than 3 billion US dollars globally during the three years between 2016 and 2018. And I would like to stress uh, our willingness to keep working together with, uh, with you, with the international partners, as well as the uh, civil societies and other multilateral stakeholders and thank you very much for let me joining in this uh, very useful and interesting roundtable thank you madam minister thank you so much your excellency for this uh, effective and supportive uh, closing remarks thank you indeed uh, we now move to his excellency jan jessler the ambassador of sweden to egypt uh, also to conclude this webinar. Ambassador Jessler, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I will um, try to be brief, um, but I have a very grateful task because um, <laughs> being the, the last one to speak, I would like to thank um, the uh, eminent participants today. 
Uh, my special thoughts go to Her Excellency Asma Shiri Labidi, the Tunisian Minister for uh, Women, Family, Children and Seniors. Uh, of course, to uh, Dina Al Serafi. Uh, and I think that the spirit of Her Excellency uh, Dr. Maya Morsi is with us today too. Um, for excellent moderation, um, uh, Dr. Mary Kawar, thank you so much for guiding us through this uh, session. Um, special thanks to the OECD, of course, to uh, Mr. Juan Giarmo, uh, Deputy Chief of Staff of the Secretary General, uh, to Ms. Raquel Lagunas of the UNDP, Acting Director for Gender, and of course to my friend Mr. Moaz Dore, UN Women uh, Director, uh, Regional Director for the Arab States. Um, I think that this webinar has been extremely uh, timely. Uh, it's possibly the first in a series um, with a focus on economic, women's economic empowerment post COVID-19 context. Um, and I hope that the uh, outcome of our discussions can inform our future um, dialogue on this subject. I'll just try to uh, uh, maybe, I noted some of the aspects that have been, been um, brought to the table by the eminent speakers. Um, uh, and I think my, my, um, my colleague, uh, Ambassador Masaki Noke, uh, 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 touched upon many of them, and I'm very happy to be together with Ambassador Noke here today. But a few key words, the corona generation, um, where women are maybe both very present, but also very targeted. Somehow that it's not business as usual, but many of the usual challenges when it comes to women's economic empowerment are present, but at a higher level. The digital divide. Um, how can one use digital payments, use e-government tools, uh, without bridging the digital divide. Also has been brought to the table the opportunity to rethink development models and maybe rethink how we approach the barriers to women's advancement. It's been stressed by many, the need to strengthen the social safety nets. Fiscal policy was brought up in the last session, but also the need for microfinance in the future. Gender-based violence on the rise, how do we deal with it? And finally, maybe I think was said at the beginning, um, we should look also at the opportunities beyond the challenges. We have heard today that we need both short, medium and long-term approaches. The importance of gendered policies and programs, of rapid response of tracking and monitoring. But also, I think it comes back in almost all the interventions, the need for a broad um, mobilizing of civil society, private sector, because just as before the pandemic, it is the private sector, not the public sector, notably the SMEs, that are most likely to be able to provide new job opportunities for women of this region. Um, in the follow-up to this first webinar, the three key agencies, the OECD, the UNDP and UN Women, will continue to advocate for gender sensitive recovery and extend support to national partners when it comes to developing and implementing recovery strategies to ensure inclusive and gender sensitive economic rehabilitation. So there is already in place through these three agencies, a kind of follow-up mechanism to take this further. As for my country, Sweden, the women's economic empowerment agenda remains a top priority. COVID-19 and its consequences will, if anything, reinforce that. Last year, we took our engagement one step further. We already have, since 2014, 
a feminist foreign policy, but we added a feminist trade policy to ensure that female ma uh, manufacturers, entrepreneurs, and consumers benefit equally from the trade policies that are put in place. And may I once again stress the importance of not only having policies that are gender sensitive, but to have women as part of the policy making. It's not of being subject to it, but being part of the creation is so essential. I've been lucky as ambassador of Sweden to Egypt. I was chosen as EU gender champion in 2019. And this is something I'm very committed, and this is an agenda I've been pushing for together with our Egyptian friends, and I will continue to do so. As Ambassador Marie-Claire Sverd Kapla, Kapla is moving on to new uh, responsibilities outside the MENA region, I would like to thank her very much for her valuable and tireless efforts as co-chair of the forum. And I would like to take the opportunity to tell you how humbled and how honored I am to have been given this new role as co-chair of the forum. And I look forward to the next edition this fall. At that coming forum, just as a, maybe a pre-taste, we, we will launch the joint OECD, the Center of Arab Women for Training and Research, and the ILO publication, Changing Laws and Breaking Barriers for Women's Economic Empowerment in Egypt, in Jordan, in Morocco, and in Tunisia. And we hope that this will inspire others to maybe make the same journey when it comes to reforms in support of women's economic empowerment, and that it can serve as a practical tool for policymakers across this region. With those words, once again, I would like to thank all of you. Um, once again, Dr. Marie Kawar, uh, thank you for, for guiding us so well. Thank you all for being with us and uh, despite the late hour to stay on this important subject that engages us all. Thank you so much. Thank you and thank you everyone. It has been a real pleasure to be with all of you. So uh, with this and with the ambassadors constructive, practical, and also uh, emotive uh, closing words. Uh, I wish to thank you all for your participation uh, and look forward for further partnerships such as this uh, to talk about ways forward, practical measures and impact, and of course, change. Thank you very much. Have a nice afternoon, everyone. Thank you.